we're going to get started now. Sorry about the delay. Not sure what happened there, um, but here we go. So my name is Matt Point. I, uh, like I said, I am the, uh, I work here full time at CWD. Um, I'm the CWD's director of advancement. So I work with all of our uh, gracious donors and sponsors, and I run our um, conference scholarship program. In a past life, um, I was the director of compliance and Title IX coordinator at a couple schools. Um, I served as the um, director of Res Life, um, assistant dean of students. Um, so I have a lot of experience of being on call for many, many years. I was the um, bearer of good news at two in the morning when I called parents. Um, and my connection to CWD and um, diabetes is I am actually married to a type one. My husband, Brian, um, runs the teen group at Friends for Life. And I attended my first conference in 2012. Hey, everybody. I was too afraid almost to put myself back on screen with our technical glitches, which is just typical of my life as a Zoom box these days. Um, I'm Lee Fickling. I'm so glad to be with you all tonight um, with my Friends for Life. I am uh, by day the Executive Director of the Disability Management System at Duke University and Health System. Uh, we provide all of the disability accommodations for students, faculty, staff, and visitors, um, both for the university and the health system side at Duke. I am an attorney by trade, um, although I like to say that I'm a recovering attorney. I do not do that very much anymore. Um, I've been a higher education administrator for the last 25 years. Um, what brings me to CWD is the fact that I am a mom to 12-year-old tween twins, Ava and Davis. Ava is my, or, uh, my green band, uh, diagnosed with diabetes when she was three. Uh, Davis was diagnosed with autism at age eight. I helped to facilitate accommodations uh, for the conference and also help to um, advise the young adult program and help to facilitate all of the moms programs at Friends for Life. So, so glad that you all are with us tonight. So just a few housekeeping um, pieces. We are going to do a Q&A at the end, um, just because we are going to cover a lot of information and there's a lot of people registered for tonight. If you're out there on Facebook land, we will not be answering questions that pop in if you're, if you're messaging the CWD Facebook. Um, we're, we're just streaming there tonight. But if you are with us on Zoom, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. You can ask them anonymously or you can send them through the chat and we will answer all of your questions at the end. Um, and don't don't be shy. Uh, Lee and I will tell you um, between 30, some 36 years between the two of us and higher ed, we have seen it. We've heard it. We've talked about it. There are no don't be afraid. We, we've heard it all. There are no question is too dumb or too silly that a parent has not already asked me in the past. All right. And I'm going to turn it back over to Lee. So tonight, we just want to give you enough information about disability laws and some of the relevant higher education laws to impress your friends at parties or to impress the other families at Friends for Life when you join us either in Indianapolis or in July in Orlando. Um, we're going to talk some about the about Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, cover a little bit about service animals, and then Matt's going to cover things about FERPA and Cleary. So want to address, before we get started, the elephant in the room, um, and just be clear that diabetes is a disability under the ADA. And I know that there are some parents out there who want to disagree with me on that. And so this is not something that we really need to disagree with. The, the Americans with Disabilities Act defines a disability as somebody who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. So for our kids that have diabetes, their major life activity is the function of the endocrine system. For those of you that have kids that have other medical conditions like celiac or other food allergies, maybe they have ADHD, psychological disorders, or like my son that has neurodiversity, those would be other major life activities that might be substantially limited as well. So um, again, I know that it's sort of varied in the diabetes world, whether we want to say that it's a disability or not. The reason why I want to be able to address the elephant in the room from the very beginning is to let you know that your children are protected by law as a civil right under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's really important for them to be able to know their rights whenever they get ready to go off to college on their own without you there with them. So when they're in the K through 12 world, you're sort of there by their side to be able to to assist them through that educational process, but the rules change 
whenever they go into higher education. So again, it's not that I'm telling you that they have a disability and I want them to rely on that as a crutch. What I'm wanting them to use that is a sword. So again, not a crutch for them to fall back on and to use that as an excuse to get out of things, but again, as a sword for them to know that they are protected as a civil right under the ADA um, should they face different types of discrimination in the future. Different types of accommodations that they may be able to seek when they're in higher education would be housing accommodations, classroom-based accommodations, extra, extracurricular accommodations, things in jobs or clinical internships or the clinical environment. We'll talk a little bit more about those in the, in the later on in the slides. So just a couple of things about differences between high school and college. There are no IEPs or Section 504 plans in college. So for those of you all that have those now, those are going to go away whenever you get ready to enter into the post-secondary world. Um, and for those of you that may be wondering what's the difference between an IEP and a Section 504 plan right now, in order to be able to have an IEP, you have to fall into one of 13 categories with a disability. And so it's not that an IEP is more powerful than a Section 504 in the world of disability accommodations. It's that your disability falls into different categories. So a Section 504 plan can be just as powerful as an IEP. It's not that one is more powerful than another. It's just that in order to be able to qualify for an IEP, you have to fall into 13 categories versus a Section 504 plan, which has more general categories in terms of falling into, you know, general accommodations that students with disabilities may apply for. In high school, there are ways that, that schools can be able to identify you as an individual with a disability. When my son was diagnosed with autism, the school actually identified him as an individual with a disability before we recognized that on our own. When you're in college, you have to self-identify as a student with a disability. The school is not going to identify you as a person with a disability. One of the big things that it's really important to know is that accommodations are not retroactive. And I think that, you know, if Matt and I can start to give you words of advice, if you could put those into a piggy bank right now, this would be the beginning of Lee's words of advice. I think that one of the things that I find in my world is that students who have been heavily accommodated from K through 12 think that whenever they go to college, they can do this on their own. They're out on their own, their parents are away from them, and they don't want to have heavy accommodations. And they think, I'm going to try this without the accommodations. My parents aren't here anymore. I don't want to go register with the Student Disability Office. I can handle this on my own. And we can't force a student to be able to go through a reasonable accommodation process. It's voluntary. And so one of the things that I will tell you is that we can, we can meet students in career fairs, we can meet students in accommodation fairs and student organization fairs, and we can hand out t-shirts and koozies and cups and prizes, but it still is voluntary for them to be able to open up the door, come in, seek out those accommodations on their own. And if they don't do it, it cannot be retroactive. And a lot of times where they do start to come in to seek us out is at midterm. And so they've tried to do it on their own. They have failed. They have maybe failed most of their classes. Then they realize, well, maybe I did need those accommodations after all. And then they suddenly want to seek us out. And we welcome them with open arms. We want to be able to help them. They qualified for the accommodation from the beginning of their time whenever they started the college after all. But we're not able to go back and sort of take away what they did not do from the beginning because they are not retroactive. And the last point on this slide is really important because this is the magic formula. Accommodations in college and in graduate school and out in the employment world are only going to be granted if they are necessary, reasonable, and, and appropriate. So that's the magic formula in terms of getting accommodations that you need. Um, in terms of things that you're looking for, you want to make sure that they are necessary, reasonable, and appropriate when it comes to diabetes, when it comes to the food allergies, when it comes to whatever the other disability may be that you're seeking out the accommodations for, make sure that those are necessary, reasonable, and appropriate. So tips for campus tours, get out there and explore, start looking at those campuses. It is um, never too early because exactly. your kid will tell you how much they love this college on paper or that they see, you know, when they watch Saturday, you know, college football game day, and then they get there and that you drive through campus and they're like, I don't want to go here. So start early because that school that they think is amazing when they see how far it is from the closest town magically is not amazing anymore. 
So that's for everybody, diabetes or not. Yeah, and I think just some of the things that you want to think about um, whenever you're looking at different colleges, and again, diabetes or no diabetes, you want to look at these different items. Are there, look at the dining options that you have on campus. Look, is there a student health center or what should you do if you get sick when you're on campus? Um, what are the campus transportation options? Is there a pharmacy on campus? Where is the nearest CVS or Walgreens? What about an urgent care? Is there one that's nearby? Is there a gym on campus or is there something nearby, you know, where, you know, if you're a student that likes to work out and that's part of your diabetes plan, what will you do for exercise? Um, and then to think about the mail services and Matt's gonna talk about mail a little bit later in another slide. So this is my magic wish list. If I would give you a wish list of things, if, you, if I had a secret list that I would be giving you in terms of looking for accommodations for students with diabetes, this would be the list that I would think that you would want to start with um, whenever you're in college. Rest breaks without penalty during exams. And that's not to give you an unfair advantage. You know, the purpose of an accommodation is to level the playing field. And so it's basically for you to be able to succeed at your educational experience minus the diabetes when compared to your able-bodied peers and your able-bodied counterparts that are in class with you. Um, so for those students that don't have diabetes, they don't have to worry about a pump running out of insulin or a pump battery dying, or a Riley link suddenly not communicating with its pump anymore. So rest breaks without penalty during exams allow you to be able to stop the clock and to be able to figure out what type of diabetes situation is going on and how you're going to be able to address it. Um, again, you're not looking for an unfair advantage for you to be able to have a lot of extra time, but really just for you to be able to address whatever a diabetes situation is that's coming up at the time. Testing in a minimally distracting environment is important, especially if you're beeping. Um, and, you know, there are times when you really just can't stop the beeping of things. Um, you know, my daughter's in seventh grade now. She ran out of insulin in the middle of class and um, we sort of miscalculated how much insulin she was going to have for the rest of the day. She ran out and she was beeping and the pump would not stop beeping. And I think the teacher wanted her to stop beeping and there was not a way to make it stop beeping. And so that's another example of why you want to be able to test in a minimally distracting environment. So that way you don't distract the other test takers that are in there. Permission to be able to keep your electronic devices with you at all times. I think that this is really important, but it's also important to know that there are times when that does not mean that your phone stays with you on your person at all times. Um, and certainly whenever you're thinking about standardized tests, that may be the ACT or the SAT, or it may be something like the, the law school admissions test or the GRE. That may mean that the phone is with you in the room, but maybe it's at the proctor's desk. Um, and it's not necessarily on your person. And maybe you have preferential seating, which is one of the next bullets to where you sit near the phone. Um, so again, reasonable and necessary. So it's not always necessary that it stays directly with you, but it, that it's still in the room to where you can hear it beep at you. Permission to use the restroom as needed, permission to be able to treat a high and low blood sugar, um, certainly, this has come up a lot during COVID. I've had a lot of phone calls that have come in from our diabetes community and our Friends for Life about what do we do about the masks. Um, when we have campuses that have a mask mandate, there have been times when they have said you may not remove your mask in class to be able to take a drink of water or to be able to have a snack. Um, and when you have a situation with a low blood sugar or a high blood sugar, you need to remove your mask to be able to treat the high and low. And so that's something that you would want to be able to write into your accommodation list. Um, priority registration is something that's really important, not just so you can avoid eight o'clock classes every single morning. Um, but if you are a person that needs to be able to schedule your classes around mealtime or not schedule them around mealtime because your blood sugar does different, you know, crazy things around meals, or you need to be able to have longer breaks after meals, you want to be able to have priority registration. Um, and then housing accommodations is something that Matt will talk about in just a little bit. All right. So I always list these two things right out because I think they're really important for you to know. First is every parent's worst nightmare. It's FERPA. So FERPA stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So when you call your students high school or middle school, they can, they'll tell you anything. They'll tell you about their grades. They'll tell you if they've been in trouble, what exactly they did, who they said it to. Um, 
in higher education, it's a bit different. And it doesn't matter if your student is 28 and you're married to them, or if your student is the child prodigy at 12 years old and goes off to college, we are legally not allowed to speak to parents about the student, their account, their grades, their accommodations, their disciplinary record, once they matriculate into the institution. And what that date counts as depends on the institution as well. Um, so from the time you submitted a housing agreement, I wouldn't speak to your parents anymore at the last um, school I worked at. So what happens usually is there's an incident on campus, whether you were sick or um, you got in trouble and you might've told mom, like, I think I might've gotten in trouble. I got this letter. I have to go meet with the Dean of Students and they're going to get mad and they're going to call Matt Point and say, Matt, what did they do? And I'm going to say, unfortunately, I can't talk to you about that. You need to speak to your student. Um, it's the law. I'm not trying to make you mad. You might be just calling to see how much they're or how much they owe on their bill. We cannot tell you without written prior consent to your student. And it depends on the institution. Some institutions will have a blanket form that covers and students can go down and check individually. I personally, just because of the type of work I was doing in housing and with on call. I made students sit in front of me and write out specifically what I could talk about. So I had a student, she got in trouble, um, had a little alcohol incident and an ambulance ride and a broken leg. But she said, I can mention those things. She also did not mention, right, that I said it also happened at a fraternity house at another college six blocks away from us. So that part wasn't mentioned because it wasn't in the written consent from the student. So I always put that out there that to have a discussion with your student because they can revoke that consent at any time as well. Um, if you call an administrator like myself and you are like, hey, I just really need to know this. I, I know you said it's the law, but I need to know what's going on. I'm paying for my student to go to the school. And I'm going to say, that's so nice that you're providing this opportunity for your student. You should speak to them about it. Thank you. And then I might refer you to a website. Um, so I always like, I know I make, I make light, but it really does. There, there's an instance for a lot of parents, but the reason I bring it up is because it goes into the housing accommodations or the, the, the classroom accommodations or the disability services as well. You might say, Hey, my student said, you know, they said they went and met with you. Did they come meet with you? And Lee's going to be like, Ooh, you got to talk to your student about that. If I don't have their consent to speak to you about their accommodation and what we discussed in the meeting, I can't do it. Um, the other one I like to point out is for everybody, not just people with diabetes, but it's also important. So the Cleary Act is a law um, around campus safety. It also requires um, institutions to publish an annual safety report and an annual fire safety report. Um, the reason I like to point this out to people is when you're looking at schools, especially if your student's looking at a school out of state or far away, and you know nothing about the area, it's a great way to learn about the crime in the area, because not only does it include crime statistics from things that happen in the residence hall or on campus, but also in the community. Um, and it's a certain radius around campus. And if you're in a city, like how many blocks from where the, we went two blocks off from every, every point of contact from one of our buildings. So, you know, we went all the way to Market Street in Philadelphia because it was two blocks up from our closest up building. Um, Please check it out. It's available on every college website. You can find their clear annual clear report. There, one comes out every three years. It includes three years worth of crime statistics. Do not let it, a clear report scare you off as well. The school I worked at, if you looked at the off campus, you would think that it was in the worst area you've ever been to in your entire life because there was like 47 assaults and this and that. But it's because the hospital was in our reporting area. And for years, the police, when they provide us the local statistics, were also giving us everything that was reported in the hospital emergency room. Those things weren't happening around campus. So something to keep in mind. The reason I also want to talk about this report is that ours, the last one I published was well over 100 pages and it also included all of the college's emergency procedures. So you can see how we will respond in the event of this happening or some a medical emergency. We also list the closest hospitals, doctor's offices, helplines, and ways to get in touch with campus officials in the event of an emergency. This information is technically geared towards students, but it is not something that you can't see and, you know, make sure that your student's aware of and then for you to be aware of yourself. This one is- so This is my favorite. This is my favorite slide of all. Not that all of our other slides are not important, but back it up, Matt. Back it up. I was up. so excited. I, I, I skipped right. you it. Just, you just blew right past it. 
So um, I actually was changing my background earlier, but it's too dark in my office, my home office. So you could not see what I had, but this is my helicopter slide. But what if Johnny won't answer my calls or this could as easily be Johnette, Johnny, Johnette, whatever your, your student's name is. So my phone rings and it's mom on the phone. And she's like, I've been watching Johnny on my Dexcom follow or my night scout and he's going low and I've called him 15 times and it's Friday night and it's 10 30 and he's not answering me. What am I going to do? What should I do at this point? Should I call the campus police? Should I call the RA? Should we rent a helicopter and fly to campus and land on his residence hall and break into his room to check on him? What should we do? And I think that this is really challenging. Like where Matt just talked to you about FERPA, like this is the point where we have to have a tough love conversation with you right now. There are 20 of you, 20 of our best friends on this call. Um, and who knows how many of you are on Facebook right now. And then there's probably 20 million of you that are going to view this later. You're going to go back and listen to our wise words. So friends for life, please listen to us. We have to figure out a way for us to be able to establish some sort of rules, independence, ideas about how we deal with our fears for overnight lows when our kids are in college um, and, and how we sort of set boundaries with that. And so if you are going to continue to follow your kids on Dexcom follow or Night Scout or whatever that happens to be. And, and I see that coming in, even if you have the health, the signed healthcare power of attorney, totally fine for you to be able to do that. There's going to be situations to where they don't answer your texts. Um, and so part of what you need to do is to come up with a care plan to be able to figure out what that care plan looks like. And what I can tell you and what Matt's going to tell you, not that I want to jump ahead to his slides, is that it's really not advisable to, and, and not what we can do is to rely on other people. You know, we're like, we can't rely on roommates to be the backup. Um, because, you know, if there's a roommate breakup and they're suddenly not getting along and they're not roommates anymore, that plan goes out the door. Um, so there has to be another way for us to be able to figure out what is the plan if Johnny or Johnette is not answering the calls. Um, and so I think that we have to figure out what happens if the internet goes out and you lose your ability to follow. What happens if you're not following and they don't listen to their alarms or they just become fatigued and have alarm burnout and they don't hear it? I think that this is something that is just as important as you're thinking about the, the list that we had earlier about where is the pharmacy, where are they going to work out, where how do they get their mail services? You need to, to have this serious conversation about what are you going to do at night? And there's been previous screenside chats about, you know, how do you handle alcohol um, as a young adult and what does that do to your body? Um, and even if they're not going to drink, I just think that covering this plan for as a young adult, when you're away at college, what will you do with the overnight situation? And I think it's really important for you to be able to figure that out. And, you know, one of the things that you might want to do as you're sort of making the list of people to meet. So there's one thing for you to do when you're touring these campuses, do the general checking. Where will they eat? Where will they sleep? Is there a campus health facility? You don't have to do the deep dive until you decide this is the place where my son or daughter is going to go to school. But then once they're admitted to the school and once you accept the offer of admission and you decide this is where they're going to go, that's when I really suggest you need to start making these meetings with people. Meet with the disability office, meet with the student health center. I would meet with the campus police if there's somebody there from them to be able to say, I want to talk about what your, what your plan is. Do you monitor these residence halls? You know, meet with the people from housing, be able to talk about what the options are, because this is one of the biggest things to where you need to be able to set your expectations right from the beginning um, to be able to figure out what is reasonable, what is not reasonable in terms of response time, because they are not you. 
and they are not going to be respond. They will not be able to respond as fast as you will be able to respond and they will not do it the way that you do it. And so I think that you need to set yourself up for that very reasonable expectation right now that it's not going to be the same. And I think that that's what Matt's going to cover maybe on the next slide. Yep. And to follow up just on this a tiny bit, it's not just diabetes. If you contact me and say, my student isn't calling me back, get her on the phone. I'm going to be like, I'll relay the message and then I'll send your student email. Your mom would like you to call them because I can't force students to do things just like I can't force um, Johnette to text you back that, you know, you know, a fruit emoji that she ate. That's just, it's just how it works. All right. So one of the things I like to talk about, um, is personal responsibility and living at school. Um, this also applies to people that you know maybe lived at home and went to school and they're moving out on their own. Um, and some of the things that I learned over the years that students don't know how to know. So on the very first night of school, after moving, the RAs are gonna do a how to use the coin operated laundry machine. It's not really about how to use it. It's to teach your kids how to do laundry. So make sure your kids know how to do laundry before they go to campus because a girl brought me a basket of clothes once. Um, so. An RA, what an, a resident assistant or the, the student, the upper class student who lives on your student's floor will and won't do. My residence life staff, the paraprofessionals, the professionals, the students, their job is to call 911 and hold open doors for professionals. That is the extent of their responsibility. RAs will not glucagon your student. RAs will not go seek, you know, drive your student to the pharmacy to pick up their prescription. That is not their job. Emergency response staff on campus, their sole role is to contact emergency professionals, whether that's a mental health professional, we have crisis counselors on call, um, whether that's campus police, whether it's the city or town (coughs) police, emergency medical services, whatever it is, that is their responsibility. So a lot of parents would come and say, okay, so Susie has a seizure disorder. If she starts doing this, I'm going to need y'all to lay her down. You know, we do not provide that type of service in the higher ed setting. Um, Have a plan. Lee has talked about this. I always talk about this because I had a student show up to school whose health insurance did not work in the state of Pennsylvania. And she could not go to a doctor or an urgent care or anywhere except for an emergency room. So where's the nearest hospital? Where's the nearest pharmacy? Where's the grocery store? How is your student going to pay if they have a copay to go? If they get sick and they need an antibiotic or to go to the urgent care and there's a $30 copay, then they got to go pick up their $10 prescription. What is their plan to pay? I've had multiple students come to me throughout the years and say, I went to the urgent care and they tried to charge me $25 to see somebody and I don't have $25. What should I do? And I'm like, I don't know, you should call your mom. So have a plan on how to pay. Know what their insurance is. So in the event of an unlikely emergency on campus, my staff is going to pin your student's emergency contact form under their shirt, especially the rescue squad. Come, um, They're going to pin it like literally like whoop, right through their shirt and send it to them. And then the hospital will call you. Um, but it's really important that's and that usually includes all their health insurance and, you know, allergies and all that kind of fun stuff. But please make sure that your student has a copy of their health insurance card. Know how it works. Um, I had a student call me before because um, they were in an office and their dad was the primary policy holder and they needed his social security number and he wasn't answering their phone, his phone. So she couldn't get checked in at this urgent care clinic. So please make sure that your student would know how to do everything they would need to do in order to use their insurance, fill a prescription and make an appointment prior to them leaving your house. Um, I know it sounds like basic life things, but when they're on their own and they're doing their own thing, it can be really overwhelming, especially if you've taken care of all of these, ordering the supplies, making the appointments, going to CVS, insulin doesn't magically show up in the fridge at home. And um, I say summer after junior year of high school, really start transitioning over so that you also feel confident in your student managing those responsibilities when they get to campus. Mail on campus. I always like to talk about mail on campus. You order your Amazon Prime. It shows up at two days at your house. Well, when I worked at um, Drexel University in Philly, we had 15 residence halls and one central receiving office for the entire university of 35,000 students. By the time it made it to central receiving and then made its way to campus, that two-day delivery could really have been like five or six-day delivery. So 
please keep that in mind. If you are overnighting supplies or insulin to your student, what the actual plan to get um, to get those supplies would be. Mail service, I'm not saying it's not reliable. I'm just saying where it's received is not necessarily where it's going to be picked up. And there might be a two, three, four delay day delay. That's also something that you should talk about or ask about on your campus tours. Does the mail, does UPS and FedEx deliver, deliver directly to this res, to the residence halls on campus? No. Oh, how long does it typically take? My student receives medical supplies in the mail. And they're like, two to three days to get it to the residence hall and to get the email notification that it's ready to pick up. Varies by school, definitely something I would ask about. And the last thing I like to tell people is to make sure that your student is confident in giving an elevator a pitch about diabetes. They should willingly share their diabetes, if comfortable, with their friends and roommate because people are going to ask. People are curious. Um, and that's the you know, if they want some, you can't rely, I can't say your, your roommate has diabetes and I need you to learn how to use this glucagon and I need you to be the, the, the holder of the juice boxes. It doesn't necessarily work like that. But if they have open conversations with their students, I've never had an instance on campus, besides if the roommates absolutely hate each other, which does happen, um, that, you know, they're not willing to help each other out if somebody needs something. So please make sure that your student talks and shares their diabetes and also looks into college resources. A lot of institutions have college diabetes network camp um, chapters so they could meet other people with diabetes on campus. So that's a great resource. I think CDN on their website has a list of schools with, um, with uh, the chapters. So definitely worth checking out. If the school doesn't have um, a a school or a chapter, they'll be fine. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that it's a resource out there. Also, on that note, I had a, a resident report a student for drugs once. She actually, I found out, had type one. And instead of using a sharps container, she used her windowsill for her MDI. So please make sure that your student is also disposing of their materials correctly. Um, and I'm turning it back over to Lee. And just one more thing about the um, the responsibility sort of on campus. I think that, you know, if I had a wish, it would be that every diabetes, I mean, every disability office on campus across the country was run by a diabetes mom or a diabetes mat. Um, but unfortunately, they're not. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we do at Duke, which I think is really important, is that, you know, we take a lot of time and sort of thinking about um, our students with disabilities and thinking about their impairments and thinking about emergency situations. And so when we think about things like snow and ice, we think about hurricanes, we think about um, disasters that could ha happen on campus, even something like a tree falling on a residence hall and people needing to be able to evacuate. Um, one of the things that we do in our office, which is unique to us because it's something that I make us do in our office, is we have a list of students that have medical conditions. And um, we share that list with people that have a need to know. Um, and part of that is trying to be able to make sure that we're able to cover this. You know, if, if for some reason our dining halls need to be able to close for a period of time, how will we feed the students with diabetes? How will we feed the students with celiac? Um, you know, if there is snow and ice and, you know, students that, you know, use wheelchairs cannot get out for some reason, how will we be able to get their food to them? And so I think that that's one of the things that you might want to just be able to think about, you know, in the event that there is some sort of weather related issue that's happening on your campus, what will your student do? Um, is there a plan? Does the school have a plan to be able to address that? I think that, you know, one of the things that back when I worked in an actual office and not on a, in a box on somebody's screen, um, you know, I have every single diabetes supply that what, that they could make in my office. And I was just waiting for a student with diabetes to be able to come in and need a juice box or need some sort of site. You know, you need a pod. I've got it for you. You need some random Medtronic supply from the 80s. I've got it for you. Um, but what I found at Duke is that, you know, our students with diabetes were very independent and they didn't want me to be their diabetes mom. But I was still there for them just in case if they did. But, you know, I would definitely talk about, you know, in the event that there is some sort of issue that happens on campus, weather related or tree falling on a building, you know, how is the school prepared to handle that? Um, so just a brief note about service animals. Um, for those of you all that know me, um, know that this is sort of a, an issue that's dear to my heart with Ava and Batman, service animal, the diabetes alert dog. Um, 
I would encourage you to voluntarily register your service animal with the Student Disability Office, even though the law does not require you to. One would be because of the issue that we just talked about. You know, if the tree falls on the building, I would want to know that Ava and Batman are in that building. Um, number two, I think it's important for the school to know where the animals are on campus. I think it's important for housing to know, um, you know, where the dogs are, um, even though as a service animal, you do not have to do that under the law. But I would still encourage you um, to be a good team player and voluntarily register that information with the Student Disability Office. Things for you to be able to think about, though, with the dog you might need to find a local veterinarian. You know, if you if the student and the dog are out playing on the quad on campus and they suddenly start to eat a bunch of rocks and the dog now needs to have a veterinarian, where are they going to go? Just like your student needs to find a CVS and a Walgreens, where is the dog going to go? Does your student have money, not only for their own medicine, but how will the student pay for the dog's food and the upkeep? And what happens when your student wants to join a fraternity or a sorority and they have a big weekend away and they don't want to take the dog with them? Um, you know, and now they've got the dog at school. Who will they transfer the handling to for the weekend? What are they going to do with the dog? Because housing will not allow you to leave the dog in the housing facility alone unattended for the weekend. Um, would not be right for a service animal, would not be right, you know, for housing regulations or anything else. Um, and then keeping in mind that local regulations may vary from the federal regulation for service animals. So it's definitely something that you need to be able to think about if you do have a diabetes alert dog and you're planning on bringing that to campus with you. Um, lastly, just uh, one note about clinical internships and rotations. For those of you that may have students that are older than the entry level college students and you're starting to think about other things, clinical rotations and internship accommodations can often look like employment accommodations. So where we talked about in the beginning that college accommodations are different than K through 12 accommodations. Clinical internship accommodations are different than even college accommodations. So don't assume that the accommodations that you have when you're in college are going to transfer over to your clinical internships and your rotations. Um, you may have to go through a different accommodation process and what worked when you were in a classroom based facility may definitely not work when you're in a clinical rotation or when you're in an internship. There are different standards that are applied to the employment world. It's a whole different title of the ADA versus what applies to you whenever you're in the educational setting. And so you probably need to prepare yourself and to prepare your student now that there's a whole sort of different standard and a different review process for those accommodation requests versus what they had in a classroom building. And then lastly, to wrap things up and to remind you of a few of our key points, visit schools early. It is never too early to start because um, like I said, there's gonna, you're going to drive five hours off highway one day to look at a school that your students talked about for years. And they're like, it's five hours from McDonald's. I cannot live here. And they're magically not going to go, gonna go anymore. Meet with the disability office, meet with housing, meet with campus police, meet with the academic advisor from your program, meet with current students. The open house is your best friend. We are in open house season. We were uh, we strategically held this meeting tonight because open house season is March and April. A lot of people do visits on President's Day weekend coming up. Um, so if you are going to an open house, most all of these offices that we've talked about today will have representation there. So please take advantage of them. Check out the local area. It's not just about the college itself. Can your needs be met here? Do they have does the hospital take your insurance? Does um, Is there a pharmacy close enough where your student can pick up their supplies? Is there a grocery store where they can get their favorite gummies that they eat when they're low? Please make sure that you check it out. One of the things I want to also point out is that um, we've talked about several times, accommodations are not retroactive. So if you come to Lee in November and say, I have diabetes and I've been missing this class every morning because I'm low, Lee's going to be like, okay, well, I can help you for the rest of November and December, but August through November, you're on your own. It's the same for housing or any other accommodation. So let's say you come to me and I find out two days before move-in day that you need X, Y, and Z due to a disability. 
we're completely full. We're on a wait list for housing, but you have a room. At that point, your option is to move into the room that you've been given until the room you need for your accommodation becomes available. We do not move students to accommodate you. We do not move bump students out of classes to accommodate your schedule, what works best for your medical needs. So the earlier you can do things, sign up for housing, register for classes is better for you. Like I said, tell your story and talk to your professors as soon as possible. Um, you know, when, when you're, it'll depend on the institution. Some schools, the disability office will notify your faculty for you of your disability and your accommod or your, what your accommodations are. Some, this last school that I worked at, we handed you a stack of letters that you came in and they were rubber banded in the front of the office and it was on you to take them to your faculty member. So you might've gotten accommodations over July, your student came, they did, you, you brought them on the campus tour, they did everything, they dropped off all their medical paperwork that Lee requested. We handed them a stack of letters and come October, they're failing and you contact me and I say, hey, I can't talk to you due to FERPA, I have your student contact me. Your student contacts me and I'm saying, hey, have you been using your accommodations? Like I saw you have extended test time that I never, never gave the letter to the professor. It's happened multiple times. The student is not accommodated until they give the letter to the faculty member and inform them of the accommodation. So just because you talk to our office, we're not going to go around enforcing it for you. Just like Lee said, in K-12, they'll seek you out in higher ed. We just look at each other and like, mm, I hope they come to our office. They should probably come visit us. Um, but please make sure that you are following through. If you are signing up or you're doing something, make sure that you turn everything in on time, speak to everybody that you need to. That is a scary step for a lot of students because in K-12, they facilitated all of that for them. And lastly, preparation is the key to success. You are preparing yourself tonight by being here. Thank you for being here or thank you for watching on Facebook or thank you for watching our recording six years from now. Um, but we are happy to help in any way, but make sure you ask questions early. The sooner you can make a decision or the sooner you can get your eye, you know, your, your mind wrapped around a decision, the easier the entire process is going to be for you and your student and your family. Um, and now that's actually it for the speaking portion of our presentation. We always get a lot of questions during um, this presentation. If you are joining us from Facebook, we are not checking the Facebook comments or um, messages. Um, so if you are here on Zoom, please, please, please um, let us know. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat. You can send them through the Q&A. Um, you can send them to me directly. We are happy to answer. Please tell me we'll get it these slides are recording. I definitely want to work through some of this with my high school senior now. I'm going to read your questions in case people are um, watching on Facebook. Yes. So our recording will be live on the CWD YouTube channel um, probably by Monday. Um, it's if you go on youtube.com slash CW diabetes, it's the same as like our Instagram and Twitter handle and all that fun stuff. So the video will be on there. And then if you email Lee or I, I'd be happy to send you a copy of the PowerPoint. My email is easy. It's matt at childrenwithdiabetes.com. Mine is way more complicated than that. So you're probably better off going to Matt. Um, there was a question that came in in the Q&A for our friends on the Facebook page. And then also to be aware for universal design, we will read them out to everyone because that's accessible for everybody. Is there any difference between public versus private colleges? So the real key to that is really in terms of funding. Um, you know, if they receive federal funding, um, just like whenever we're thinking about K through 12 schools, that's the key um, is that and truly, you know, in the college world, most colleges are going to receive some form of federal funding. So it really there's not really a difference. There's one level. school I can think of in the entire United States that doesn't. That is completely that does not receive federal funding. Yeah. So federal but funding, I mean, like you can file for federal financial aid, like you can file a FAFSA there. Yeah. But I mean, you know, even like community colleges, um, you know, you can still seek accommodations in community colleges as well, which I'm a huge fan of community colleges. Um, so I think that that, again, you need to, to seek these out. Um, and what I think that you're going to find in the college world is not going to be the fight that you may have faced in the K through 12 world. 
Um, I think that, you know, we as diabetes families have run into issues from preschool all the way to high school, you know, to where we've had to sort of fight for these accommodations at times. We've had to fight issues like after school programs, before school programs, field trips, and all of that. You're not fighting that at the same level in the college programs. If you go back to the slide deck that we had before, which we'll make available to you, and you go to sort of that magic wish list that I gave you, those are the things that you really need to focus on. Um, and, you know, those are the ones that are necessary, reasonable and appropriate for a college student with diabetes, um, even at the community college level, at a junior college level. I think that those are the things that, you know, I would approve um, if a student had diabetes, because I think that they would be something that would be reasonable. I just think that, you know, when you start to, you know, an example of something that might not be reasonable would be if you have a student that says, I need to live in a triple room by myself because I have a lot of diabetes supplies. Um, that may not be reasonable, you know, because you're not bringing four years worth of diabetes supplies with you to college. You know, you couldn't even get four years of diabetes supplies. And if you could, I need to know what your secret is. Um, you know, so I think that, again, focusing on the, the standards of necessary, reasonable and appropriate, if you use that as your guide, when you go in to ask for these accommodations, most likely you're going to be successful. Now, I'm not saying that it's always going to be sunshine and unicorns. I don't want you know you to think that necessarily, but I do think that you're going to have more success than you probably do whenever you're in the K through 12 world. And to speak on Lee's, what she just said, um, I like to tell people that just because it's appropriate and reasonable and necessary at Duke does not mean it's reasonable at Moore College of Art and Design in Center City, Philly with 450 students. It depends on the institution. It depends on what the offering is. It depends on what the buildings look like. Um, so just because your friend's daughter got X, Y, and Z at West Virginia does not mean that you're going to get X, Y, and Z at University of Florida. It, it's whatever is deemed necessary, reasonable, and appropriate by the, in the office's disability services person. Right. Yeah. And there's a couple of reasons why institutions can say no to an accommodation request. One of those would be if it fundamentally alters the technical nature of an academic program. That's a reason to say no anywhere. So it doesn't matter what the nature of your program is. That would be a reason to say no if it fundamentally changes the program that your student is going to be enrolling in. Um, so, you know, an example of that would be, you know, if your school has a residential requirement and they say that it is so unique to our school that we require all students to live on campus. But what you're saying is, but wait, my student has diabetes and I need them to live at home with me there's a very good possibility that that one might be denied because that would be fundamentally altering the nature of that very specific nature of their program where they require everyone to live on campus. So that would be a reason to say no. Another reason why they would say no is if it's an undue administrative or financial burden. And so just like Matt said, you know, the expenses for, you know, fulfilling an accommodation would be very different for somebody that's a junior college a technical college versus, a, you know, another institution that is very heavily endowed. So those would be different reasons why we would say no. So there are definitely reasons why different institutions could say no, and they do say no. Um, we have a couple, I received a couple questions via text. Um, thank you, Heather. Um, so one question that came from Facebook was, is grad school, medical school, law school, et cetera, the same or similar as far as getting accommodations? Oh, Heather, so glad that you're out there in the Facebook world. Um, it is. I think that, you know, one of the things that is challenging, I will tell you this, is that some of the accommodations that you may have gotten approved, not necessarily for diabetes, but let's just say for other, other accommodations, um, things like permission to record lectures or a note taker may not be as easily approved in the law school world because there are professors who don't want to be recorded because they are convinced that they are going to become Supreme Court judges um, and they do not want to have these recorded lectures released out into the wild later on in the world. Um, so I think that there are times when it is more difficult to negotiate accommodations at the graduate and professional school level. 
Um, but for the magic list, um, you know, testing in a minimally distracting environment, extended time, you know, in order to be able to stop the clock to deal with diabetes related issues, permission to be able to have your food and drink and your juice boxes with you, those things that are the regular diabetes related accommodations, totally, you're going to be able to get those implemented. But when it comes down to um, accommodations for other things like related to ADHD, um, some of the psychological um, accommodations that you may have, sometimes those are a little bit more challenging, not to say that they cannot be done because they absolutely can be done. Um, and I think that, you know, certainly whenever we look at things like medical schools, um, there is a big shift now in welcoming students with disabilities and certainly welcoming students with physical disabilities and changing the way that we think about the way that we perform the nature of our academic services and, you know, really changing the way that we view disability on campus. Um, so I think that we're getting there, but I think it may just be a little bit harder. Um, a couple more questions that have popped up. If we have a healthcare power of attorney in place, does the school need to share information about our student with us? No. I will say, please have your student come to my office and provide written consent. Thank you. And then you'll say, but I'm paying. And I'll say, that is really nice that you're providing your student with this opportunity. Please have them come to my office. Um, so no, actually, I, I, I say it jokingly, but it doesn't matter. FERPA pretty much trumps everything. Think of it as the HIPAA of higher education. I can't talk to you about anything. Even So I've had students, it was a graduate student who um, uh, was married and her spouse called because she was actually in the hospital and was like, hey, uh, my wife was injured and like she had a surgery like I think she like fell and broke her arm or something can I con and I'm like sorry we can't talk to you because we don't have written consent and it was her husband um so doesn't matter healthcare power of attorney anything like that we are legally not allowed to speak to you would you I'm totally agree yeah yeah I think that um that's going to be an issue you know I think that one of the things that you can do is you know certainly with student health you could put it on file um, you know, and since it's a healthcare power of attorney, you could put that on file with student health um, and, and see, you know, if they would be willing, you know, to be able to sort of negotiate any sort of conversations with you. Um, but I think that that still it's going to be limited. You know, I think one of the things that has surprised me the most in life, which is not in what to expect when you're expecting or what to expect in the toddler years, is the fact that when my kids turned 12, I lost the ability to control their my chart and they got their own my chart as 12 year olds. Um, so I can no longer see their appointments. I can no longer, you know, sort of control what's happening in my chart in the, in the medical world um, as 12 year olds. My kids are not even in college. My kids are in seventh grade. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the world that we live in. So I think that that's preparing me now for what's getting ready to happen when they go up and grow up to see Map Point and housing. Um, but it does not make it very easy for me. Yeah. And so trust me, I've freaked out many, many times over. Yeah. So yeah. To, the, if you had a healthcare power of attorney, the health services office might be a little bit more open. Um, but us housing people and like emergency people and the student records people, because they can get in a lot of trouble. We are not going to share anything without written consent from your student. Um, one of the questions that popped in says also have a HIPAA release signed. Same thing. Yep. Doesn't do anything for you on campus. I'm like, that's nice for you. Have your student come see me. Um, because and like for HIPAA with us, I we're not a, as a student affairs professional. Like I could have, right. if a student for a FERPA violation, I could have been personally sued for it. So nobody's right. going to talk to you unless they have the student's written consent, because it's just easier to cover your basis that way. Yeah. And in my office, like HIPAA does not abide, like we don't abide by HIPAA because we are not a medical office. We are not, um, that HIPAA is not something that applies to us. What applies to us is FERPA in our office. So another question, what if the student doesn't want to deal with asking for the accommodations due to a social anxiety or similar condition? Is there a standard form they complete so the parent can ask for it or do they absolutely have to do it themselves? I'm going to speak on it first and then I'm going to let Lee take over. So you might be able to, there might be some sort of FERPA waiver that'll allow you to help get the accommodations in place and get the paperwork to the right person. But a faculty member 
who, especially if it's at a school where they're, the student's going to have to like speak to the faculty member themselves and deliver their accommodation letter, they're going to tell you to kick rocks and probably like shut an office door in your face. Faculty members are not going to speak to parents. No, that is the Matt no longer works in higher ed answer. Yeah, I think that, you know, I wish, you know, you can, you can help your students you can lead your student to the website, you can lead your student to the office. Um, But when it comes down to the actual meeting between the student and the the disability office, they're going to have to be the one to do it. Now you can be right by their side and, um, and knowing you person who asked the question, the way that we know you like totally, you can be right there with beside the person. Um, And that's very appropriate. And certainly, you know, for students that are incoming, going to college, their parents are right there beside them um, to support them and help them through that. I think that what you can do in advance is you can say, my child has social anxiety. This is going to be sort of a difficult conversation. Is there a way for us to do this low key, you know, to where it's not like they walk in the door of the disability office and everyone is like, hello, welcome to the office, new student. Like we don't have to do it that way. Like it can be totally like low key, Um, very chill, very relaxed. And so I think that you can sort of set the student up for success in a way um, to not make it completely overwhelming to where they walk into a conference room and just completely shut down. Um, So there's ways that we can help you with that. And I know I say like jokingly, like the faculty member is going to tell you to kick rocks, but tenured faculty members who've been on campus for 30 years, that's really my, what they would tell a parent. It's just personal experience. Um, But Everybody on campus is there to help. There's a reason, especially the student affairs staff, like the housing and res life and the disability people. We are there because we want to help students. And that's why we, I have a master's degree in higher ed. That's why Lee has one too. And that's why we do this is because we cared about the students. And we had such a great experience in school that we wanted to share that experience. So I know I I like say it like in a horror story kind of way, but I'm just trying to like make sure that you're prepared if you're not getting the answers or responses that you want to receive. We have two more questions. It looks like Um, one of them, we kind of just answered it. said, so when do you ask for the accommodations after you commit to going there and who asked the parent or the student student can parents be involved? We already answered the second half of that, but the first half of the question, I'm going to let Lee answer really quickly. I want to tell you this with all of the kindness in my heart is that I'm not going to answer your first question until you commit to my school. Because what you're going to do is you're going to shop around for the best deal. And I don't blame you because I got two kids of my own that need accommodations. And trust me, I am right there with you. And I'm going to be shopping for the very best accommodation that I can do, trying to convince someone to tell me what kind of package they're going to give my kids. But normally, colleges are not going to commit to being able to tell you what kind of accommodations they're going to offer your student until you are admitted to the school and until you accept the offer of admission. So that's two different things that have to happen. You've got to apply, you've got to be admitted, then you've got to accept the offer of admission. And then as soon as that happens, then you can sort of get into that negotiation. So, you know, normally what happens during the junior and senior year of high school, you're doing your campus tours, you can set up your meetings with the disability offices, you can go in and you can have these preliminary discussions to talk about you know, what are the types of accommodations that you normally offer to people with diabetes? And they'll tell you generally what they offer. Um, But it's not until you actually accept the offer of admissions that they'll sit down and like, look at your letter from your endo, look at your letter about any other medical conditions that you have or any other disabilities that you may have, and then work up that accommodation package for you. And I think that Lee, you know, really swoops up Right now, when you're touring and picking a school is when you are asking the generic questions. Do you, how do you accommodate? So, you know, if they're like, um, generally for people with type one, we would make sure that they're in this building because it's the closest to the dining hall and this and that, but nothing is guaranteed. And accommodations are personalized for every student. So just because Susie Joe got X, Y, and Z, you might get A, B, and C at the same institution because it's about having a conversation and all accommodations per the ADA are (laughs) custom for, you know, for your student. It's not, you know, we're not just like, oh, type one, that's stamp C. It doesn't work like that. Um, 
So, you know, it's, you know, after this, after you were the school, I, the one school I worked at, we didn't actually have those um, formalized anything until after the students were registered for classes because it was a studio based art school. And based on your studio schedule, would affect some of the accommodations because there were seven hour courses and we would schedule which meal you time you were slotted to because of the way the coursework happened in the program. So, um, it really just depends on the school. We have one more question. It looks like, do you recommend type one students get a single do dorm room? It's a residence hall. Um, uh, and do most do that? I, I think this is this is just going to depend. That's my legal answer. It depends. Um, that's why I went to law school and I have a massive gigantic loan from law school to teach me it depends to be able to issue that out as my advice. Um, it depends. Um, it depends on what you're looking for. You know, do you want to have somebody to be the backup to hear the beeps? Um, or do you want privacy to be able to have all of your needles in the window, like Matt described, and change your sights freely and have your tubings out all over the place? And I mean, you know, there, there's just sort of different ways to be able to think about it. Um, I think that you need to think about what else is going on. I can tell you that the prevalence of students with psychological disorders on college campuses is skyrocketing. Um, it's our, you know, it's a huge, huge issue on college campuses these days. And so I think that whenever you think about asking for a single dorm room, you need to think about, is there anything else going on along with the diabetes? Um, and so really think about the single, you know, is there, you know, is it better to be by yourself or is it better to be with a roommate? Um, and, you know, I think that, that there are, you know, I've been a housing professional for a billion years. Matt's been a housing professional for less than a billion years because he's much younger than me. But, you know, we could talk a long time about, you know, the positives and negatives of having a roommate. Um, I think that it's really going to be up to you and your family to sort of make that decision. But I think that there are lots of there are lots of benefits to be able to have a roommate. And like Matt said, I think that it's really important to have your elevator speech um, whether you have a roommate or not, you know, whether it's the people that live next door to you, whether it's your sweet mate, um, you know, whether it's the person across the hallway from you, I think you need to figure out what your 30 second speech is um, about the diabetes, how you share that with somebody. Um, if you are in a single, because I think it's important to be able to have a backup. Um, because I think that as we know with diabetes, it can go right for a long time. And then when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. Um, and without having your mom and dad there to be able to support you, you're going to want to have somebody else, you know, to be there to support you. Um, and it's probably not going to be, you know, a college professional that's going to be there. It needs to be one of your peers. And so a lot of times that's somebody who happens to either live with you or live near you. Yeah. And just because you request a single or your student requests a single right. as part of a comment does not mean it's going to be approved. I Lee will tell you, I am like the bare minimum accommodator and Lee is like the far opposite end of the spectrum. That's why we like to do this presentation together because as an institution, I'm responsible for everything that we say that we're going to do for you. So if I think I can get away with, and it's not that I don't want to accommodate you. Part of our jobs and roles on campus is to also protect the institution. Um, you know, so if I think that it might be more of a risk for you to be in a single by yourself, or if I just, I'm expecting housing to be at 103% capacity, I'm just going to deny it because, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know if she should even be by herself. You know, she couldn't even come have the conversation with me and had to bring mom along. Um, so just because the accommodation is requested, doesn't mean that it's going to be received. So I always like to make sure that people know that um, just because you ask for something does not mean that it's necessary, reasonable, deemed necessary, reasonable, and appropriate by the institution or the person who's overviewing the case. So, oh, thank you. This was really useful. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. I was going to say, I don't think we have any other questions. I want just to make sure we didn't miss any. Um, I didn't see any more come in from Facebook. 10 more seconds. Does anybody have a last minute question? Um, 
If not, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please make sure that you are scheduling your campus tours. The open house, like, yes, you can schedule a, like a private tour of campus, but you will meet the most people at an open house. Those are my personal recommendations because every person, every office is going to send a rep to send at their table. That all like the little disability services sign and their little housing sign. And it's going to be some angry 23 year old new grad who just got hired um, that they're there on a Saturday, but they're going to be excited to answer the questions or it might be Matt and Lee, because I used to volunteer for everything, um, you know, to answer your questions, but make sure you get your questions answered because there's no harder conversations to have with students and parents about and if the, the questions and the conversations are happening after the students on campus. Um, I don't want to tell you that we can't do something that your student needs to be successful. That's not why I went into higher ed and that's not what we want to do. Um, so make sure you're asking your questions early. Any other last words of advice, Lee? Thanks for coming tonight. Appreciate yep. it. Good to see yep. you all here. Let us Thank know if we so can much. answer any other questions later. Yep. So if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. I can um, forward them along to Lee if it's something that I can't answer. My email is matt at childrenwithdiabetes.com. And on behalf of Children with Diabetes, thank you for joining us tonight. And if you're interested in future screenside chats, you can check them out on our website at www.childrenwithdiabetes.com or directly on the screenside chat page at cwd.is slash screenside. Have a great night. Thank you.